He's got a nerve, that Richard Ingram's, eh? Bloody cheek. I mean, how'd he like it if we all went round slagging him off? Well, I don't read that private eye myself nor nothing, but if you ask me, that Robert Maxwell's got a point. Swat him like a fly, string him up. Only bloody language they understand, them people. Richard's campaigns, it seemed to me, were all based on the decision he'd made uh, in life when he left Oxford. He hadn't got a very good degree, therefore he couldn't go become either a spy or a top civil servant or a leader of industry or a tyro in the city. Therefore he set out to make a living uh, tormenting those of his contemporaries who had. For instance, a particular uh, hatred of his was Peter Jay. He was a great friend of Peter Jay's, but he deplored the way that Jay became a successful diplomat, you know, ambassador to Washington. He, he couldn't see why Jay didn't want to sit in an office in Soho in a grubby jersey writing jokes about diplomats. If someone is a friend, they're more than ever likely to be attacked. Uh, I mean, for example, Christopher Booker is a great friend of Sir Lawrence van der Post, but he is attacked every week and ridiculed in the Silver Crin. Partly for that reason, I regret to say. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. There was a period in the 70s in particular when I did get terrifically uh, worked up about, the, about the, the, the nastiness of private eye and its ability to you know, print things that were totally untrue and very damaging about people. In fact, there was one particular case where a friend of mine, I, in the end, I said that you should sue them because they really told such lies about you that uh, you should go to court. And because of that, I did actually leave the magazine for a while. And that's when I wrote that article uh, in 1976, saying that it was perhaps the nastiest thing in British journalism or was on its day. Writing as I did uh, fortnightly, uh, sort of total um, uh, muck <laughs> about anybody. One desperately needed enemies. And you see, most people in life have only got three or four enemies. And by the time you've sort of covered them, uh, you're rather gasping for air and wondering what to write about next. Well, luckily, uh, throughout the history of the diary, people quite gratuitously either sued it or um, insulted it or um, objected to it. And then you had a new target, you see. That was wonderful. I did, I did feel uneasy about one or two of his personal campaigns against individuals. And I think probably I should have been stricter with my blue pencil looking back on it. Because I think, I think he does get, he does pursue personal vendettas against people out of malice. <laughs> uh, and that is regrettable. Uh, you must only put in what you think is true or interesting. Once you start worrying about the consequences of what you're going to put in, you won't be any good. And people think that's very callous. They did a thing the other day about uh, Joe Haynes. Uh, Joe Haynes, uh, he, he, a colleague of mine here, he's a fitting target for uh, private eye, as far as I'm concerned. He's a great enemy of private eye. But uh, among what the things they said about him was, I, I don't care whether it's true or not, but if it's true, then it, it's absolutely insufferable that it should be published. It's very wrong. It's the old, that old, awful old public school thing of saying, you know, ha ha, there goes a cripple. And they don't see it that way. And there's an awful lot uh, in Private Eye about that. Clive James uh, said uh, Private Eye is the magazine that sends children home crying from school, which sounds quite good, except you know in real life that it's the behaviour of parents that sends children home crying from school. I was never tremendously moved by that, because having four children of my own, you know that children cry, and then they stop crying, and that's that. And you can't get tremendously sentimental about children crying one afternoon, and then they can move on to the next thing. And uh, if you weren't allowed to attack anybody because his children or his grandchildren or something were going to cry on the way from school, we'd all be absolutely silenced. I think if you're in public life, you've got to take it. You, uh, we're all ridiculous people. We're all stuck in sort of pompous and absurd attitudes, and you can't complain if they're exposed. Anti-Semitism is totally opposed to any form of genuine socialist belief and should be completely abhorrent to anyone... Uh the question of anti-Semitism, which uh, is often raised uh, against private eye, is very, very often confused, as it is in society generally, with a, a very strong anti-Zionism. I think one of the things that private eye has done is to write quite aggressively about uh, Israel and, and Zionism in general. I am personally 
I think, uh, sensitive to what are offensively anti-Semitic remarks. It can reach the exact level of anti-Semitism that exists in uh, upper middle class English society, a public school uh, English society. Uh, they would never recognize us. They would say, Richard used to say, no, no, we're, uh, we're anti, anti everything. I remember someone saying to him, but look, you always have these stories about these corrupt Jewish businessmen. And they said, uh, well, that's because there are so many corrupt Jewish businessmen. Uh, it, it didn't occur to him that uh, Private Eye may have, uh, may have made a great fuss about the corruption because they were Jewish, and, and he would never accept that. Uh, on anti Semitism, I made one or two jokes which weren't well received. But I didn't, they weren't so anti Semitic jokes, they're just what I call Jewish jokes, which Jewish people are allowed to make and others aren't. So, um, you know, one doesn't like causing that sort of offence, so one stopped, stopped making Jewish jokes after a time. Uh, but th that, I suppose, was fair criticism. I don't, I don't think it's true I ever made seriously anti gay jokes. And I've always, in fact, been a sort of half baked supporter of, of the sort of gay pride movement, but only half baked, not, 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 not totally baked. <laughs> Makes you think, though, doesn't it, eh? I mean, 16 chopped up geezers down a train. Oh, or how many is it now? <laughs> you probably don't even know yourself. No, that's the thing of it, you see. I mean, there's all these thousands, literally thousands, of these young vagrants walking around London, right? I nearly knocked one over in my cab the other day. Nobody would have missed him. Mind you, don't get me wrong, I've got nothing against your puffs. I am a very strong opponent of what you would call the gay rights campaign and the attempt to sort of turn homosexuality into a political issue and to suggest, for example, that homosexuals as such are on a par with, say, uh, Muslims or Jews, that they are a, uh, they're a downtrodden minority in this country, which seems to me absolute nonsense because there is no, there is just no such community. I think there's been a certain amount of sniggering over the years, which you may or may not like, um, but the main allegations came from that uh, cartoon strip, The Gays, which Michael Heath ran, which in fact um, Gay News wanted to buy at one stage and ended up, I think, as a rather good picture um, of that sort of urban gay life. There's a wonderful one where um, people came back to their flat and said, oh no, we've had gay burglars, um, the furniture's been rearranged and there's a quiche in the oven. And it, it was all that sort of joke, which I thought was in the end very funny. And Michael Heath killed off the strip um, by mutual agreement right at the height of AIDS when he decided there wasn't much more funny to say um, about that particular scene. It's like, you know, they talk a lot of bollocks in the back of a cab sometimes, you know, they expect you to listen, I don't listen. What do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, how badly are we going to lose? I had that Ian Islop in the back of the cab once. I think satirists have to know what they don't like. They have to have a view of what is being done wrong, have a view of what isn't desirable, and therefore the positive comes out of that. So you have to be um, putting the boot into something <laughs> in order to suggest that something else might be better. You have to constantly be aware of the charge of hypocrisy, because after all, something like Private Eye, if you say, what is it against? It is basically hypocrisy which is the besetting sin of most politicians. So that you ha I think you have all the time to consider, well, am I, if you are writing critical pieces, is that a charge that can be made against me personally? And if, if you say, yes, it is, well, then you shouldn't be making it. Um, and journalists are much more, I would say, guilty of hypocrisy than politicians, actually. I think it's helpful if I haven't got my hand in the till or my leg over my secretary. Uh, but uh, beyond that, I think uh, I can be human. I'm a great believer in, in original sin myself, uh, which is a very uh, perhaps unfashionable point of view. But it seems to me the best attitude to proceed from that human beings, if left to themselves, will probably behave disgracefully. And uh, <laughs> that we need something or other to keep us in check. Psychedelic baby, 